Hi, I'm Pete Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is Restless Remarkable Books number 40. The first book today is No Other Life by Brian Moore, 1997. Now this, uh, this book is about the, uh, is a fictionalized account of the former president Aristide in Haiti. And you know, Haiti is in this country in the Caribbean, the western third of the island of Hispaniola. So this is an, a fictional account of his life, and uh, these uh, characters, Gane and Jeanotte. And Jeanotte is an orphan. He's, uh, you know, African, African, uh, Haitian, raised by a white Canadian priest. He becomes a popular hero and president of Haiti. However, and, and, and Jeanotte, now he's, this is uh, Aristide, he fights the corrupt system to help the poor, but it's a very tough struggle. God bless Haiti and Aristide. Yeah, the um, Haiti's been a country that I've long uh, been interested in, and this Aristide is, uh, I think his name is, I don't know his first name, Jean-Claude or something, no, that's not it. Anyway, he was, there were high hopes that he would, uh, you know, bring good government to Haiti because they've had, you know, they've been plagued by bad government dictatorships, the Duvalier, uh, father and son dictators. So, uh, anyway, he's no longer president. This has this got me interested in him. A lot of hope that he would bring uh, good government to Haiti. He was a, he was a Catholic priest and, uh, and very popular, and so I'm kind of curious uh, to learn more about him. He was president several times. He was, pre you know, he was elected and then overthrown. There were military coups because he was, you know, fighting corruption. And so anyway, it's a very interesting story. And uh, the country of Haiti in modern times, a fictionalized account. I think it's very tough to, uh, I think every country gets the government it deserves. So, uh, you yeah, know, people are always looking for political saviors, but... Anyway, and he was someone that I certainly was supported and had high hopes for. The next book is Road Show by Roger Simon, 1990. This is a book about the 1988 U.S. presidential election. Uh, George Bush, who was the Republican nominee and uh, nominated, or, or and, and elected, and uh, served uh, four years, for, served one term. And, you know, they called him a wimp. I think that was a very unfair uh, accusation. That, that, in other words, he was weak. He was not a weak man. Jesse Jackson was uh, actually a uh, very charismatic African-American candidate. He finished second behind uh, Michael Dukakis for the Democratic nomination. You know, sort of a forerunner of Barack Obama. Uh, Al Gore, who uh, ran and uh, did not, uh, didn't make it, but that was, his, I think, his first foray into national politics. Mike Dukakis, who uh, did, uh, was nominated and didn't have much charisma. Good guy, but uh, he didn't ha wasn't wasn't uh, charismatic enough to win. And then, of course, Dan uh, Dan Quayle, the guy who was really people were so cruel to, who was the uh, vice presidential nominee and served as vice president under uh, under President Bush. The book talks about the power of the television media. And there was this issue of Willie Horton, this black guy who had been uh, on uh, leave. They had this uh, system in Massachusetts when Mike Dukakis was governor where these fellows could go, I guess, go home on the weekend from prison. And uh, while he was out, he committed a murder. So they were, you know, implying that uh, Dukakis was weak on crime. Pat Robertson, who was a Christian minister who ran, and I think as a Republican, so any, and then Gary Hart, who had uh, run in '84, and then of course he had a he was a womanizer, and this really brought down his uh, for, for the, brought down his his campaign. The next the next book is Stadium Stories: Pittsburgh Steelers by Norm Vargo, 2005. Well, this is an NFL NFL book. It's about the tremendous uh, 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 NFL team in the 1970s, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Talks about guys like Chuck Knoll, their fine coach, Terry Bradshaw, the tremendous quarterback, Mean Joe Green, the the amazing uh, defensive lineman, Jack Lambert. I think he was a linebacker. Lynn Swan, tremendous uh, wide receiver. Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer, the two outstanding running backs. So they they won four Super Bowls back in the 70s. An amazing team. 
The next book is Living, Laughing, and Loving Life by Dan Miller with Gene Zorns, 1987. This is a tremendous book. The author uh, uh, got polio when he was 18 years old, lost 80% of the muscles in his legs and his left arm. Yeah, polio, there's this muscle atrophy due to polio. However, so this was some tragedy. However, he overcame the tragedy to become, become very successful. He became a teacher, musician, a pilot, a principal of a school, a golfer, comedian, and public speaker. So just imagine, a golfer, even though he lost. So th- this shows you, you know, the, the power of determination. You know, this guy could have given up. It's like, wow, look what happened to me. You know, he could have given in to negative thinking and just lived a very, uh, you know, kind of worthless life. Not, to, But he accomplished so much. So he, he fought back and he through positive thinking and through prayer. and Good guy, very inspiring book. The next book is Fatherhood by Bill Cosby, 1986. Yeah, Bill Cosby was this tremendous comedian during my childhood, back in the 60s, 70s, and he had this, the Cosby show in the 80s. And he was, uh, had five, he's the father of five children, talks about his experience, experiences as a father and a lot of confusion. And uh, he talks about how fatherhood has changed as women's status in America has changed. That, you know, father are, fathers are expected to be more nurturing and help out more around the house since so many women now are also working uh, outside the home. So uh, a sense of humor helps. Very sad what happened the things that he, you know, that he did that were very terrible, involving you know sexual abuse of women, and that's uh, certainly horrible. But uh, you know, I, I think it's in light. It, it's it's tragic, kind of. I, I would say maybe the pitfalls of fame. But I think uh, we should never condemn anyone completely, and still acknowledge the good that he did, while also recognizing the the bad that he did, and that's what this book talks about. The next book is America on Six Rubles a Day by Yakov Smirnov, 1987. This is the story of the experience of a Russian immigrant comedian in the United States, and he describes his life as an immigrant. Plenty of jokes. He talks about the tough times in the Soviet Union. So this is this is a wonderful book. The you know the immigrant experience, which, which I think is very important because so many people have moved from their country of origin to another country. And, uh, you know, of course, I did, I did this as well, 20 years in the Philippines, so um, it's very interesting. We should try to understand what immigrants go through. The next book is Soul Influence, Basketball, Corporate Greed, and the Corruption of America's Youth by Dan Wetzel and Don Yeager, 2000. This is a very fascinating book. It's about the, uh, the Nike versus Adidas rubber shoe war, you know, basketball shoes, or what they used to call tennis shoes. And uh, the other companies, Converse, Puma, and Reebok. And, you know, for a long time, it was, of course, Nike has, has emerged the, the dominant company by far. And I guess Adidas is number, a, a distant number two. Way back when, a Converse was popular. And for a while, Puma and Reebok, I think they're still around, but they're sort of a minor companies. And the book talks about how the search for the next Michael Jordan is taking the childhoods away of great young basketball players. Yeah, see, the thing is, uh, Nike, well, it was it started in the 1990s. This is really when uh, rubber shoes or basketball shoes became extremely popular. And <coughs> Michael Jordan's, and it coincided with Michael Jordan's career, which was uh, really spectacular in the 1990s, winning six NBA titles. And then he teamed up with Nike and was this, uh, you know, they paid him a lot of money. He was a, sp- a sponsor. Or, and uh, there were all these commercials, and everyone was, you know, buying uh, these Nike shoes. And there was a real war between Nike and Adidas. I think Adidas had been more popular. And then, so what's going on now, these companies think, wow, if we can, if we can find the next Michael Jordan or the next superstar and uh, get him to endorse our shoes, you know, then uh, we're going to make a lot of money. So... Yeah, I know. I know. LeBron James actually signed a huge contract with Nike right right after the NBA draft. I think and these guys are making a lot of money, and so it gets to the point. That, yeah, that the uh, there's this big money in in, in these shoe shoe companies, and they're 
and they're looking for the and so these young guys are just in high school or even younger and they're getting and you're being courted by these shoe comp these uh, basketball shoe companies very interesting the next book is the trouble with boys by angela phillips 1994 well the author the author's uh, one of the messages she has is that the world is a mess because boys are raised to be violent mothers can't teach boys to be men but the father's not around so you know very often fathers are either busy or you know the parents separate you have all these boys growing up without fathers fathers need to nurture their children not just the mothers doing that yeah i've, I've read that they you know they talk about these high school these shoot guys going into high schools shooting up the schools and some people have said you know most of them have didn't have a father and this is a huge problem in our country huge problem with Af young african-american men who grew up without a father and fathers are important so uh yeah, and I guess boys are kind of raised to be tough, you know, and stuff like that. But, you know, they need, they need to be loved also. We all need love, and so this is uh, interesting. You know, if you look at the prison population, it's like 90% men. So many troubled men, and it, it goes back to their childhood. The next book is Childhood's Future by Richard Louvre, 1990. You see, I was reading, you know, I was a high school teacher, and I was interested in the issues of children. And uh, this book deals with the problems of kids today, the loss of traditional family. You know, people don't have uh, ex that many uh, family members anymore because everyone's moved around so much. And, and the neighborhood, the same thing. You don't, a lot of times people don't know their neighbors. Television, which has all these kids just sitting in front of TVs and not developing. Cultural problems, the need for community in raising children. Yeah, we need to help. You know, it's not just up to the parents. There needs to be more people involved in raising children, and uh, that, that's one of the problems. In the old days, you had the extended family and the neighborhood all helping to raise children, and now that's really gone. Now it's, it's just like the, it might be just the mother and the schools. So we need, we need more people need to get involved to help young people get through this tough time of life and, and hopefully avoid uh, getting in trouble. And children need positive contact with adults. So often, you know, yeah, the, these kids, you know, the, Let's say the, the, the father is not around and then the mothers are all busy working and then the parents and the, and the, and the teachers, you know, are so busy with their work that uh, nobody seems to have time to have, uh, you know, positive interactions with kids. So that, that needs to change. The next book is Balls by Nancy Kincaid, 1998. I thought this was a fascinating book. It's a, it's a novel. I believe it's a novel. And... Uh, the, it's about the women in the, in the life of a big-time college football coach. Uh, Mac Gibbs, he's this character, he's the white, and his wife Dixie. Mac has no time for his family. Coaching takes all of his time. He wins a lot of games in football, but loses everything else. The insanity of sports. Yeah, these guys getting carried away with, you know, winning and uh, tragic. This fellow, I guess, you know, I, he didn't have time for, you know, to time for his wife and children and uh, I guess got carried away with his work and felt he needed to be working all the time so that they could win you know win and, and that was you know the all up consuming obsession when it because college football is really in some places almost like professional football because it's it's the big it's the big thing going in the especially these t places like Alabama and Nebraska and so forth very interesting uh, topic the next book is Irving and me by Sid Hoff, 1967. This is a children's book. I read it out loud to our son, Tim. There's this character, Artie Granick, and his parents. They move from Brooklyn, New York City, to Florida, where Irving Winkleman helps uh, Artie cope with the bully, Charlie Wolper, and a pretty girl, Arlene Morgan. Yeah, so this is about the challenges of childhood, especially moving. You know, this happens a lot. You know, the father gets... Uh, different jobs, family has to move, so this is, this is really tough on kids, and uh, they have to, you know, you lo they lose all their friends and go to a new, maybe a new culture, and, and you know, dealing with other kids, you know, like it says, dealing with the bully and dealing with the pretty girls. <laughs> the next book is Reviving Ophelia, Saving the Selves of Adolescent Girls by Mary Pfeiffer, Ph.D., 1994. I thought this was an incredible book. And I really, really love Mary Pfeiffer's books. She, did, 
She describes the nightmare of so many American teenage girls and, and their families, what they go through because of a sick popular culture. The pressure to be super feminine, sexual, fashionable, and distant from their parents. Girls endure violence, the loss of self, and then so many of them develop these, these eating disorders like anorexia, bulimia, and depression. American culture needs to change. TV, movies, and magazines are promoting a junk culture. Yeah, you have all these models who are very, very thin. You know, the, the standard of beauty has changed. You know, now it's the standard. It's like super thin. All these girls, they develop, you know, they, they don't eat enough because they're trying to be beautiful. And they develop these eating disorders where they could even die. And it's, it's terrible, horrible. And, uh, yeah, so this, this is a very interesting uh, topic, the way girls are growing up and, uh, you know, how... How culture, we have these cultural problems. We need to, culture, you know, culture is powerful. Culture does change and it, you know, it needs to, in some cases, it changes for the worse. In this case, but we need, it needs to change for the better. And we, and individual, individuals can play a role in that change. Very wonderful author, Mary Pfeiffer. The next book is The Hard Way, Writing by the Rebels Who Changed Sports, by, edited by Will Balliet and Thomas Didja, 1999. Talks about these, uh, well, as he indicates, rebels, Dennis Rodman in the NBA, Jack Johnson, the old uh, boxer from many, many years ago, Kurt Flood, who helped bring uh, unionization in uh, baseball, Jesse Owens, tremendous runner in the Olympics, Bill Veck, the baseball owner, Jim Bouton, baseball player. Marvin Miller, who was, I think, the head of the baseball union. Doc Ellis and Dave Megiesi, played in the NFL. Wonderful book. Very good job. The next book is Real Boys' Voices by William S. Pollock, Pollock Ph.D., with Todd Schuster, 2000. Uh, this, in this book, the author interviews boys and talks to them about their lives, and they speak out about drugs, sex, Violence, bullying, sports, school, parents, etc. The boy code, which limits behavior. You know, the idea of this is how you're supposed to behave as a boy. I remember one time I was reading books. Uh, I was an adult and a student says, oh, you like to read books. You're, you're a girl. <laughs> I thought that's sad, you know, if you're a boy. Oh, well, my God, you know, boys can't read books. It's, it's terrible. So it's the challenge of being a teenage boy in America today and how to help them. Very, very important topic. The next book is The Overscheduled Child, Avoiding the Hyper-Parenting Trap by Alvin Rosenfeld, M.D., and Nicole Wise, 2000. Another very interesting book. It's outstanding. It describes how American parents nowadays are pushing their kids too much to excel in sports, school, and activities. Everyone is going crazy with the insane American lifestyle. Too much going on. The simple life is the best. Yes, this is the title, The Overscheduled chi uh, Child. You know, all these things. The thing is, uh, you know, we need balance. And some, a lot of these things, that are, there's just, it's too heavily, uh, there's, a there's been a loss of uh, unorganized play. You know, when I was growing up, actually, I played a lot of baseball with my friends. No adults involved. And it was, it was fun. Really enjoyed it. So much now, the kids, everything is sort of very organized with, with adults, you know, leading these things. So the kids are constantly being uh, driven to this place and that place. And then when they, you know, there's pressure to get high grades, to excel in sports and all the different activities. And it's just too much, too much pressure. You know, it's uh, too much, I like to say, too much going on. And we need to change this. This is a, you know, our country has changed for in this case, a lot of it sounds well-intentioned, you know, these activities for kids, but, it, you know, the kids the kids also, they need downtime. They need just time to, to spend time with their friends, joke around, and, and play with their friends without adults, you know. Or very often adults really take the fun out of sports. The next book is 100 Yard Lie by Rick Tellander, 1989. This book talks about the corruption of college football and what we can do to stop it. Very interesting and philosophical. Deals with the issues of steroids and violence. The author says the college football players should be paid. And uh, it's very interesting because the college, you know, college football programs make an enormous amount of money. And uh, the, but the, and the players, if the good players in the top schools, you know, they get a, 
they get a they get a scholarship. In other words, free college education. But some people think, oh, that they're not getting enough, and that the uh, the schools are making all this money off of these athletes. So uh, it's it's an interesting topic. Very interesting. The next book is 40 Ways to Raise a Non-Racist Child by Barbara Mathias and Mary Ann French, 1996. So, interesting topic is how to help children of European American, African American, Hispanic, and Asian cultures get along to have a better world. Yeah, we all need to get along and have respect. Certainly we don't need to be racist anymore, and that's no good because that's, you know... That's kind of like organized meanness. What's the point of doing that? You know, and uh, it's, it's just wrong because it's just it's a waste of energy. You know, people are hurt. We're all hurt by it. And, you know, we, we need to have respect. And, you know, God created all of us. And we need to, uh, and all cu- cultures have good and bad points. We need to learn from each culture. So this is, this is very interesting, a very important topic. The next book is Marcus, the autobiography of Marcus Allen with Carlton Stowers, 1997. Uh, this is a, a story of, of Marcus Allen, who was the tremendous uh, uh, football player, running back. He won the Heisman Trophy. He was a Super Bowl MVP and a tremendous running back for the Los Angeles Raiders and the Kansas City Chiefs. He gets into an interesting topic. When he played for the Raiders, uh, he, he says that Al Davis, the owner, for whatever reason, developed a dislike for him, or maybe he was jealous of him and hated him, and ordered the coach to have him benched when, when Marcus played for the Raiders. Yeah, well, people are, this is possible, and Al Davis was a very uh, strong-willed guy, but there was, it, this was tragic if this happened, you know, because here he, he's got this star player, and he's ordering bench just because he doesn't like him or he's mad at him. Too bad. The next book is How to Survive in Your Native Land by James Herndon, 1971. The author talks about the insanities, the insanity of schools, how schools destroy children. But a teacher can deal with the insanity and do some good. Still, the system rolls along. Well, this is life, you know. We, we have to face life as it is. In our church, we talk about emotional maturity, the ability to deal with to deal uh, effectively with reality. We all have to deal with reality. And yeah, there's you know, things that are going on in schools. Maybe you don't, know, uh, some of the things are bad, because, but they're just part of the human race, part of the world today, you know, the way human beings are. And you can waste time uh, uh, focusing on that. But the thing is, teachers can do good, you know, regardless of the situation. We, we can do good. We can be kind to children. And we can try to be patient with them and help them to, to develop a level of learning, regardless of this system of education. We can still have a positive impact. The next book is Looking for Love Do by Ann Jones, 2001. This is an amazing book. It's a travel book set in Africa. And the author is a 55-year-old American woman. She travels with a 30-year-old Englishman across Africa. They drive all the way across Africa from Morocco to South Africa. Oh, my gosh. I remember reading this. I could not believe what these people were doing. And uh, I guess the the Englishman was, uh, his name was Muggleton, and he conked out in Kenya. I guess he'd had enough. And so she she finished the, uh, I believe she finished this trip on her own. The driven Englishman in a hurry. What an adventure. He dealt with with corrupt governments, wonderful people, and they almost uh, in in what's now called the Congo, back then called Zaire. They almost that almost finished them off because it's a very very hot country, and they were having all these problems. And there was a hor- horrific civil war there, and uh, they had to deal with the heat, mud, bugs, and disease. I know one some of the things I remember from the book. I know they asked you know when they crossed borders from one country to another, which they did a lot. They were having a lot of trouble with these. Uh, with the soldiers who were manning the borders when they want to enter a country. And uh, the guy ended up being really, in, you know, he would yell at these guys if they gave him trouble. And, and, and it worked, you know, that, that they would, <laughs> somehow they would see, that oh, this guy has authority, and then they would back off because there's, you know, a lot of corruption. Soldiers trying to get their money, and, uh, yeah, so this was amazing that they did this. And at one point they, they met some, 
I think some Europeans, I think it was in the Congo or somewhere in Central Africa, who uh, had, I think their car broke down and they developed depression, you know, this malaise because of the heat and the humidity and the, the whole situation and what they faced. And so I, I thought this was really interesting, an amazing book, uh, traveling across, driving across Africa from north to south. Incredible. The next book is Ancient Secret of the Fountain of Youth by Peter Kelder, 1985. Wow, this is a this is a pretty short book. It's more of a pamphlet. The Tibetan Rites of Rejuvenation. And you do these teaches these exercises that you can do to, to get to get energy. And uh, I haven't been doing them for a while, but I, I actually did them for quite some time to get uh, help improve your improve your health and part of it's uh, in, uh, working on the person's posture, people, of course, I've had bad posture actually my whole life and uh, at least since childhood, and that's been, a, I think, a huge problem for me in my health and my physical and mental health. But uh, anyway, it was, um, this, is a, this is a book, as it, the title indicates, you know, Rejuvenation. The, the, the author talks about even older people, if they can start doing the, these exercises, they can become younger. And I, actually, I need to do them myself because I, haven't done them for a while, and I could use them now. Very good, wonderful book. The next book is Bo Knows Bo by Bo Jackson with Dick Schaap, 1991. Yeah, the famous Kansas City Royal baseball player and, o and Oakland Raiders NFL football player tells his story. He was really, so this is in the 90s. He became a famous, uh, late 80s into the 90s, famous. He was a big home run hitter in baseball and then this tremendous running back. Really something. It's kind of like Paul Bunyan. Yeah, but then his, his career uh, ended fairly early because uh, he got hurt and a severe injury as a running back. The next book is Dog Song by Gary Paulson, 1985. This is a story of Russell, who is an Eskimo young man. He's fed up with the white man's ways, pollution, noise, and disease. He tries to recapture the old ways of hunting with sled dogs and with a bow and arrow. And this old Eskimo named Ugruk teaches him. It's a wonderful children's book. Again, it's the same topic of American Indians and you know dealing with the uh, Western civilization and uh, you know trying to get back some of the good things from the old days. The next book is Timothy of the Key by Theodore Taylor, 1993. This is the sequel to The Key. It's a wonderful book, and it gets into uh, old this old uh, African uh, Caribbean guy. Uh, Timothy, before the story of the key, his life as a sailor in the Virgin Islands, and this uh, the white boy Philip getting his sight back and visiting Timothy's grave on their key. Uh, this is Philip was the boy, you know. There, the key is about the you know this old Caribbean guy and the young white boy, and uh, and uh, he comes. T Timothy died, you know, during this typhoon, and then so Philip came back to pay his respects to. Uh, uh, to Timothy, who, you know, really had saved his life, and they developed this wonderful friendship for a short time before Timothy died. Wonderful. The next book is The Education of Little Tree by Forrest Carter, 1976. This is an incredible book. Little Tree is a, he's an American Indian. His parents died, and he's a f only five years old. And he, he's a Cherokee Indian. He goes to live with his grandparents in the mountains of Tennessee. He had a wonderful chi childhood with them. Love, and he was loved by his grandparents, a lot of nature, and very simple. The wisdom of Indian ways. Yeah, and his, his grandparents died. I know his, his grandmother, I think I remember, she, she, she uh, pinned a note to her dress, and then he found her she had died. And he had to go off and face the world. You know, he lost his parents and then his grandparents. So, wonderful book. Yeah, so, anyway, uh, it appears we're out of time. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you find a good book to read. I hope you have a good day. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.